I want you to allow God to encounter you today. Imagine if God was the one that wanted to have a meeting with you today. That meeting might not be something that he planned, but it's the meeting that is spontaneous simply because he loves you. He just wants to be with you. What if God wants to surprise you and just hang out with you? What if? What if this is more than just a religion? What if this is more than just going through motion, a church service, Sunday morning, another Sunday? What if this is more? What if God says, I just want to hang out with you. I want to talk to you. And hear this. We just sang a song, I want to know your heart. Think about it. I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, conservative church, more religious church. When I say religious, I mean going through motion. Is my son Johnny here? Johnny, would you take a seat right here, please? I just feel it. This is random, but it's good. And he wouldn't feel alone. Jonathan, come join him, my friend. Thank you. I love this guy. These two are unstoppable. Come on. Oof. Come on. It's my <laughs> man. I love it. See, I hit him. He didn't even move. So I was about to go back. It's my, my boys. One is fast. One is strong. But I, I, I look better than anyone. Anyway, watch this. Everybody, watch this. Watch this. This is very important. In what situation would you ask God, I want to know your heart? See, I grew up in church where I never asked God about his heart. I always ask, hey, what I do, is it good enough for you? See, I ask, look at my deeds, look at my work, look at my, the way I act, my action. My words, are you happy? You better be. Am I making to heaven? Is in the book of life is my name under my name. There's a lot of points, sub points, bullets. I've done enough, God. In my mind, that's how I saw it. I never ask him about it because heart implies that I want to know him rather than being good enough. Watch what Paul says. Fascinating scripture. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, we're just going to read for context and just zoom in on, on verse uh, uh, 18. But watch this. He says, be careful then how you live. Careful meaning not like I'm watching you, but in other words, for your own good. He says, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Why are days evil? It's not like there is more darkness. There is, but it's not so much that point. It's that... You think that you have so much time. But the fact is, the time tricks you. It's here today. It's gone in a minute, in a moment. It's gone. And if you don't take an opportunity, if you don't take the moment, it's gone. And then he says, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What, what does God want in this moment? It's not about someday. It's not about future. It's about now. It's at this very moment. You are where God wants you to be. He says, don't be foolish. Don't be tricked. Know what God wants right now. And look what he says. He says, do not. Everybody say, do not. Do not get drunk on wine. Everybody say, say do, not. do not. Can you say, do? I want you to see this. Look, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. In other words, <laughs> by the way, just before I go to another words. The wine is very, has very little to do with this, being drunk. This is just an example to something bigger. And that is, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, which we know. Once you're drunk, you go crazy. Not good. A lot of consequences. Instead, every, everybody say, be. be. Watch the difference, everybody. Don't miss it. Do not. Instead, be. Do is working B is B until you understand that the very heart of God has nothing to do with doing but has everything to do with being you always have a struggle an internal struggle about Christianity you always misunderstand God but you will always misunderstand your parents because it's always about you will misunderstand marriage you will misunderstand 
business. You will misunderstand community because it's always about performance. It's always, it's always about doing it. And if you do good enough, bonus, yes. Performance, more money, yes. It's about doing it. How many marriages fall apart because people are tired of doing it? I do all these things for you and you're still not happy. I'm out. Arrivederci. Adios. See ya. I'm out. And both are wrong. One is always unhappy and the other one is wrong because I'm doing all these things for you. In fact, those that say I do all these things for you are even more wrong. It's an older prodigal son who says, all these years I work for you and you did not give me a party. And here's a young man who come home barely awake from being drunk and sleeping around and wasting all the money. And now he has a party because the younger one just wants to be a son, but the older one is about doing it. But be filled with the Holy Spirit but be do not get drunk which leads to what instead be 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 the person be filled with the Spirit the best example I can give you is this Genesis chapter 32 we're gonna read verses 22 to 30 watch the story and most of you heard the story this is a story about a man called Jacob a story that watch this the story there would his mom was pregnant there's two babies in, in, in her womb two boys okay Two boys. And so in her womb, this boy, Jacob, realized that his position in the womb of his mother, Jacob was positioned behind Esau. So a little baby, as some people would say, embryo. Okay, don't get me started. Okay. You know, that baby inside mother's womb says, I ain't going second out because if you're going first, we're both ready to come out. But if you're going first, all the blessing, because in those days, if you're firstborn, all the blessing and the inheritance from parents to the first one was, you ready for this? Anywhere between 70 to 90%. And then for everybody else, take the 10% split. So why should I come 0.3 seconds behind you or whatever, how quick is the doctors are, you know, what I could be first one. So what he does in his mother's womb, Jacob, this boy, he holds his brother's heel. Hold, this is what the Bible says. You can read the story. He's holding, he's like, dude, you're not going out first. It's your story. He's holding his, I mean, wow, this kid is a fighter. True story. So he comes out, guess what they named? He came second, of course, because brother was like, get, get, get off me. I'm about to get strangled. My neck is through and stuck, so get off me. So he goes out and they name him Jacob. Jacob, we had actually Jacob at the first service and Jacob knew his name. Jacob or he's probably still making coffee there. Jacob, the, the meaning of the name Jacob, you know what it is? Come on, anybody knows it? Just like, just, just what happened there. Heel grabber. So parents realize that the first one is coming, they pull the first one and he doesn't want to get out. And his heel, the first boy is stuck. He's trying to shake it off. Like a proper wide receiver, just let me go. Got the ball. And he's like, he's, he's like the brother is like, I'm not letting you. They're like, who's, oh, his brother. Knock, knock, who's this? Me, Jake? Okay, you're going to be Jacob. You're, you're grabbing heel. So he tricks his brother by trying to be the firstborn, tricks his mom, tricks his father, runs away for his life, finds a girl, he falls in love with a girl. That's a story, true story. He loves her, she's beautiful. So he's like, uh, sir, I like your daughter. How can I get her? And he's like, you have to work seven years for her to, for her to become your wife. He's like, deal, I'll slay for you for seven years. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> seven years work for the girl, okay? <laughs> The difference is you're going to work for me for seven. But, and so I'll let you get married. But so he does that. And look, look what happened. He, and then on the day of the wedding, after seven years, the father-in-law gets him so drunk that he doesn't understand what's going on. He falls asleep. Okay. And he falls asleep. He wakes up and he's sleeping with a different girl. His, his beautiful bride sister who has weak eyesight, not as beautiful. And he's like... We, last night, we were 
hanging out. Yeah, no. Yeah, was it us? You and I? Yeah, really? Oh. oh. Dad! Dad, what happened? Oh, it's not fair, son. You're my son-in-law now. It's not fair. I, she's older. You have to take her first. But I love your other daughter. It's like, okay, you want her another seven years. True story. I'm not making this up. Read the story. So he gets both. Leah and Rachel. Rebecca was his mom. So he gets both. He gets both. And what happened? What happened? Now he has 11 sons and a daughter at that point. And his brother that he tricked and took his first um, inheritance. He says, I'm coming after you with 400 men. And I'm going to kill you. So he's so afraid. He's about to lose 11 sons, two wives, two servants' wife, and he's, he knows it. So he's alone hiding. And watch this. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servants' wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. And what? This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And the men came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the men, we know it was the angel. Some believe it was Jesus. Okay. When the men saw that he would not win the match, this angel realized that Jacob is fighting. This is a last chance. He's about to be killed. He doesn't know what to do. He, there's no way to escape. He can't run with little kids. He can't run at least 400 athletes are after him. He can't run. He has kids. He has wives. He has servants. He can go nowhere. He has nowhere to hide. So what does he do? He realized, whoever is fighting me, I'm all alone. I'm going all out. And if I'm going to die tonight, I'm going to die tonight. So he starts fighting for his life. He doesn't know who he's fighting. But he realized that the person he's fighting is too strong, <laughs> surviving everything. So what happened? This man saw the angel that he would not win the match. He touched. Now he's using his supernatural power. He touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. He takes his hip and just like, one touch. See, God lets you play in a bubble. You're taking a bubble bath and you're like, oh, nice. More foam, please. Looks nice. And then God says, oh, enough. I'm going to add extra hot water. You're like, oh, it's so hot. I'm out. God says, oh, it's okay. You know, he says, he says, then the man said, let me go. Angel says, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. He realized that the man he's fighting all night has a supernatural power because he just touched his hip and wrench it out of his socket so he realized it must be God God that kept watch this kept encountering Jacob throughout his life kept kept reminding him Jacob here I am your God I love you I promise you grandfather Abraham that I will bless you here I am here I am here I am but Jacob kept doing kept doing his own things kept tricking people kept living his life kept trying to survive kept trying to be successful on his own kept trying to impress people it will always backfire, but he kept doing it until this moment. And at this very moment, he realized he's fighting God. So he's like, I'm not going to let you go. He's probably screaming and crying. He's crying out. He's like, bless me. Not letting you go even if you kill me. I have nothing to lose. And watch this, everybody. Watch this. This is how God dealt with him. He says, what is your name? The man asked, what's your name? My name is Jacob. I grab heels. I do things. I'm a trickster. That's what I do. I am defined by things I do. How many of you are carrying stigma, carrying identity, carrying labels that somebody placed on you because of what you've done? What about your father speaking over your life? Your father being angry because you made a mistake. What about your mom? What about your grandparents? What about your teachers? What about your boss? What about your friends? They gave you a name and you carry with you. Walk with that. Your name is Jacob. I do things. That's what I do for a living. They define you by the living. And if you're not successful, what if at some point something doesn't go well? Oh, I said you're not blessed. You're cursed. And you live with that identity in your mind and look look what God does God says <laughs> Jacob verse 27 God says your name will no longer be Jacob you will not be defined by what you do by what you do 
by what you do, everybody. The man told him, from now on, you will be called Israel. I said at first service, I'm going to repeat one more time. I've done a lot of research on the meaning of Israel, the meaning, the term, the definition of the term Israel. And by far, the most scholars and historians believe that Israel from Hebraic, Hebrew original, means one that sees, S-E-E-S, sees God, not saw God. Because if you saw him once, see some of us, we experienced God once. We said, oh, I, I'm saved. Uh, Christ showed up in my life. He, I realized that he stretched his hands on a Calvary for me. So I accept him as my substitution for, a substitution for my sin. Now I'm saved. So that's it. I'm going to heaven. We encounter God once and we stay there. But God says, I don't want one encounter. I don't want you to saw me one time and that's it. One that sees God. It's a continuation. It's a, it's a, it's a relationship. Yeah. We're just saying, I want to know your heart. Not I, at, at some point, I wanted to know you. I met you. Great. We're done now. I'm going to be in heaven. See you in heaven, God. One that sees God. He said, from now on, you'll be Israel. Just to finish quickly, verse 29, next page, Vladik. Because you have fought with God and with men have won. Please tell me your name. Please tell me your name. By the way, you fought with men and won with God because of God's presence. That's for another Sunday. Jacob says, please tell me your name, Jacob says. He still walks with it. He says, why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. He encountered God. It is, on, oh, it is only in the presence of God that your identity is changed. Bigger than It is only in the presence of God that you have a transformation. Transformation that doesn't happen here anymore. Earning things, performance, working for it. But now it comes here, which is... I'm Israel. I want to see God on a continual base. Yeah. I want to always be in His presence. It's only in the presence of God that your identity changes and your perspective. That it's no more marriage by merits, but marriage by being a husband, being a, uh, being a wife, being a father. It's being. And it doesn't matter what your spouse or anybody else, what they think about you as part of the marriage. It's about being because when you know who you are because of God's presence in your life, it doesn't matter. You don't have time to lower yourself and fight and fight every person that labels you or defines you or saw a little piece of you under different angle and different microscope. Who cares? If you live with being rather than doing, it's a different story. So let's go back to Ephesians and we're about to pray for each other. Here we go. He says, do not, do not, because you want to do things. Oh God, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Ah, I'm tired. Nothing and no one can help me. Wine will help. I'll get drunk. I'll forget my reality just for a bit. And some go to the point that whatever helps, let me just numb my pain and numb my reality. And so they continue being drunk. He says, but be filled. Be, be, being versus doing. Be filled. Be the person. Be the person. Watch. In fact, throughout the history, God, even though he gave them Ten Commandments, it wasn't his intention. Because Ten Commandments is what? God is only one God. Love him. Honor him. Honor his name. Remember Sabbath. Honor your parents. And then we go into doing things. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Are you with me? Do not lie. Do not what? Do not covet. It's all do not. Just like here. Do not get drunk. So we keep chasing people. Trying to see why they do things they do. And we say, oh, nailed you. Found it. Got it. Got you. But God never intended for you to live that kind of lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of fear. It's a lifestyle of consequences. He says, but be, be, be the person. But be filled. 
Stop doing the work of a father. Stop doing the work of a son. Stop doing the work of a daughter. Stop doing the work of a grandma. Be the person. Stop, stop doing the work of a, an, an employee. Be the person who got the DNA of a company. Carry its DNA. Becomes the company. Then you get promoted. Then you get elevated. Then the company prospers. You can never build a successful company with doers. I don't care how, how much they do. At some point, they'll burn out. They'll get, even if they are the best workers possible because they're trying to make money. Please don't fire me. I need the money. I need to take care of my family. You can manipulate them. In fact, it's not good for you. If they are good workers, you start abusing them. Take advantage of them. It's not good for your heart. You go crazy. But when they take on a DNA, you cannot build a family with two doers. You have to have, you have, to have two beings, a husband and wife. Only at that point, you're going to have a successful marriage. So God always wanted to, you to be, but, 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 but how is it possible, God? You gave me 10 commandments. How is it possible that I be the person? And God says, I'm going to give you my spirit. Because the only way you can be the person is when God is in you. And that is the Holy Spirit. So be what? It's not just be the person. Be the best that you can be. No. What does it even mean be the best that you can be? How do you define that the best that you can be? That's not a biblical statement. Be the best that you can be. Great. You know how you define it? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled. Allow God to be in your life and in your heart to overwhelm you to, to the point that you're like, oh, this is what God wants. I am the person, God. I'm the man. I'm the woman. I am the person for the job. It's not about the job. It's about me being it. And then it's easy to build a church. It's easy to build marriage. It's easy to build community, friendship. It's easy because you are being but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, consequences of those, the beautiful fruit, he goes into two directions. He says, it's going to be corporate worship. When you get together as a church, you're going to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Keep reading it. Okay, and then you're going to sing to the Lord. So it's a corporate, all of us getting together Sunday, Wednesday, whatever that is. And then he goes from verse 21, he goes into family. How are you going to be an amazing wife? How are you going to submit to the leadership of your husband? Verse 22. Only by the Spirit of God. You cannot. If you're a girl, 21st century, you can't, you can't just tell a man, <laughs> whatever you say goes. Come on, girl. Be honest. It's going to last a couple of days. Maybe. And then you see some things you don't like. You're like, amigo, behind me. I'm smarter than you. Or he says to the man, starting in verse 24 and 25 and 27, he's like, and you, amigo, you, the boy, the family, love her as Christ loved the church what and gave himself christ gave himself up for church so you have to give yourself up for your wife <laughs> are you kidding me god i'm not god i'm not you i'm a man how can you be that kind of man that can give yourself up according to her needs be there for her because she needs you not because you want something how is it possible only by being filled with the holy spirit there's no other way there's no tricks there's no other key. Trust me, there's no other key to marriage. There's no other key to church. It's being filled. In fact, if church is not filled, people in church are not filled with the Spirit. It's going to be a religious gathering, religious environment. It's going to be a religious church. It's going to stink at some point. You're going to get tired, exhausted. You'll be hurting inside, wounded, because somebody said something over you, spoke over you, declared over you. Somebody crushed you your path or whatever happened and then you get hurt and you say I'm leaving and God says I didn't call you to do things in church I called you to be the person in the church that changes the outlook that changes everything I want you to close your eyes God is so very very much in love with you he's so in love with you I believe as we were praying and fasting this week believing that God will encounter us I believe that he today he wants to change change the way you see him 
He wants to change the way you see yourself, the way you see your life. The way you see your life. Aren't you tired of doing things? Aren't you tired of performing? Aren't you tired of earning? Aren't you tired of system of rewards and punishment? Aren't you tired of hiding things that you do, hoping that you are not going to be caught, pretending to be something you really are not? Aren't you tired of building a facade, being a phony person, two-faced? Aren't you tired of that? Pastor John, I'm none of that. That's awesome. I'm glad you're none of that, but I'm going to ask you a simple question, and that is, are you the person, are you the person that God has called you to be, to be in whatever capacity that is? A married person, a family person, a minister, a leader, a business person, whatever that is, are you the person? And if you are, how easy it is for you. Because Jesus says, my yoke is easy. What I place upon your life, it's easy. It's easy. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It's easy. It's not, it's not a heavy burden. Following Christ shouldn't be heavy. Why? Because He gave you the Spirit of God. He has given you a Spirit of God. Wow. A Spirit of God that enables you to be. Life was not meant to be hard. Where you're constantly struggling and fighting, constantly surviving, constantly just hoping to make it. Life was meant to be living in freedom. Freedom to be who God called you to be. We said it last Sunday, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. It's freedom not from things. Not just cutting things in the past that happened to you. Or happened with you being involved. It's not just cutting it off. It's freedom to be who God called you to be. To be. To be. I, I want to be a, a father, a husband, a minister, a leader, a person, a servant, a friend, a citizen. I want to be the person. I need the Spirit of God. I, I want the Spirit of God to fill me up. I don't have strength. I have to admit I don't have strength. I don't have stamina. I'm not strong enough to withhold temptations, to stand against all the tests, all the waves of issues that are facing. I, I, I'm not strong enough. My, my immune system is not strong enough. I need the Spirit of God. I need God who wants to live in me and with me. I need that God on a daily basis. I want to be like Israel. I don't want to be Jacob. I don't want to do things. I don't want to hide from people. I want to be Israel. I want to be a person that sees God. Continually sees God. I want to be that kind of person. As we're going to worship right now, I'm going to open an altar.